Thank you. We are back with Professor Catherine Phillips for Why Diverse Teams Are Smarter webinar. The conversation continues. We received so many great questions. We want to get to those now. All right. Good? Okay, yeah, let's great. do it. All right. So first one comes, hi, I'm asking as a startup on the brink of hiring its first key hires and what will eventually become a core team. How important is diversity in the context where we have to take fast decision and align our work strongly? Yeah. This is a really good question and one that I, that I have had before. Um, there's certainly research that actually looks at how do uh, new organizations usually emerge over time. And oftentimes there is a start with a relatively homogeneous, uh, highly connected, tight-knit group that then grows to have more diversity. Um, so I think there's a couple things for you to think about. One is, uh, what is it that you're trying to accomplish in, with this new entity that you're creating? And what are the norms and expectations you wanna create from the very outset, right? And so um, one of the things that I encourage people to think through is the fact that diversity fits within a larger context of your organization. So if you think about all the things that you're trying to accomplish, you have your people, and their needs and perspectives and what they bring to the table. And that has to be coupled with what is the culture that you're creating? What are the formal structures that right. you are putting in place? And what is the task itself? What is the work that you're trying to do? Right. And the goal is to try to make all of that fit together right. in a really meaningful way. So if you're going to have more diversity, you have to think about, well, what is the culture that I'm creating? What are the formal right. structures? And how do I define the work that we're doing right. so that I can actually get the benefits from that diversity I right. have? So I encourage people, to think about where you want to be in the longer term and recognize that um, the history of your company is something that you can never change. You have the benefit right now of creating that history. Right. And if you want to have a history and a legacy that actually builds diversity into the very fabric of who you are and what you do, it may be worth the benefits now that you're seeking, right, to actually bring mm -hmm. that diversity in and just be thoughtful about how do you create the culture? How do you right. say to people, you know, we need this diversity now right. while we're trying to get started so that we have it forever, right? right? So that it's baked into who we are and what we do. Right. Do the work before. Do the work before. before. I mean, you're going to have to do the work at one point or another. Anyway. And what your what your question is actually highlighting is, you know, it's kind of trade-offs. We're always constantly thinking about short-term benefits versus longer-term benefits. And it makes sense that sometimes we say, you know what, for the short term, let's just do this right. because, you know, I don't want to do the work, right, right, that's going to benefit me in the long term. And what I would argue to you is that the norm is to focus on that short term. And so if you can find a competitive advantage in any way, it's it's going to you know, be right. built into that thinking about the long term now so that you're better off than the other competitors that you're, you know, other companies you're competing right. against. Right? Well, and it's interesting because what you mentioned, the the legacy right. aspect of oh, it. Oh, yeah. And that's one of the diversity issues with the company when you say, well, I work for this CEO, I've, I've been here for 20 right. years, and this is, the way, you know, that, right. that diversity is there too. Mm -hmm. This is the way we've always done it. So with a startup, right. you know, you're basically, it's, it's you know. It's a blank, blank slate. Blank of slate. And yeah. you, it really would behoove you to do the work that's now. That's right. That's you don't, right. You don't have those issues. That's right. That you normally would. All right, wonderful. This is from Kristen. Uh, is it effective to search out others, diverse people, backgrounds, race, gender, technical skill, et cetera, in other ways rather than as a team setting or a small group? Example, one-to-one, -one, search out to learn more about other perspectives to help mm -hmm. your own decision-making mm -hmm. ability or help them inform the team you're on. Yes, absolutely. Um, so there's, there's work that organizations have to do, work that teams have to do, work that we as individuals have to do as well. And so I think it's really important for, for us all to have a commitment in our own personal lives, and our own decisions about who we talk to, who we seek out, how we seek them out, um, that we actually are deliberate about exposing ourselves to difference all the time. And so there is very good research that um, looks at things like the more exposure you have to diversity, the more comfortable you are with that diversity. Um, there's research that shows that people who are uh, who go to different countries, live in multiple countries, uh, experience different cultures, mm -hmm. actually benefit from that. They can be more as themselves, more creative individuals, et right. cetera. And so I think it's really important for us all as individuals to have a commitment and to be open to difference and to be open to seeking out people that we otherwise wouldn't have relationship with. Um, I think that it makes it, first of all, it's just, it's like practice makes perfect with just about everything in our lives. And there's no different when it comes to diversity. So absolutely seek out people that are different from yourselves. Who are you going to lunch with on a daily basis? Who are you having breakfast with? Who do you invite to your home? Who do your children see you engaging with on a regular basis? I think sometimes people, um, you know, kind of 
say to their children, diversity is a valuable thing, but children actually watch your behaviors right. as well. And so I think it's really important for you to, to, for, for you to recognize that you are setting an example uh, of what it means to actually live in a diverse society and to engage with people who are different from yourself. Right. So I absolutely would encourage all of us to be open to right. making those connections across boundaries uh, and building relationships across boundaries. And I have more, I have research that I've been doing on that as well. It's not easy, oh. but again, Again, um, it's easier oftentimes to do when it's one on one right. than when you're in a group, right? right? Because one on one, we have we have norms right. of right. politeness, quite frankly, that benefit us right. when we're engaging with a person one on one. Right. Uh, we can't dominate the conversation and only uh, I'm the only one talking. And in in it's not a conversation if I'm the only one talking. Right. So there's there's like benefit to doing that one on one connection. Right. So I think it's a very good question, and I hope that everyone will. Um, take this as a as a challenge of sorts to to challenge yourself to go out there and make connections with people who look different from you. Well, and do you, I mean, do you, in your research, are you finding that people who are seeking mentorship, mm -hmm. let's say, seeking that connection, yeah. are they looking for diverse mentorship, or by and large, are they looking for not right. diverse? I mean, are they looking yeah. for to maybe someone to like. Yeah. validate some concerns they have. Are you going through the same thing? Right. Or are you looking at it like, what is your perspective on what I'm feeling now? Or, right. So is it, where does that so, come from? Does yeah. the leadership have to handle that? Or do people, you know, it's, right. I think it's hard it's, to ask it's someone. A really, it's a really good question because I think there's, it, it's kind of like multiple things are happening at the same time. Right. In that um, I will tell you, you know, personally for myself, I absolutely have friends who look just like me, who have similar experiences as myself, and I need that. We all need right. that. The idea that birds of a feather flock together and that um, we seek similar others is normal. Right. And, and in fact, it's adaptive, right. right? And so we have adapted that kind of behavior and we seek similar others all the time. Right. So when I walk into a room, the first thing I do is look around, is there anybody else in this room like me? Right. Um, that is a normal thing for us to do. And it is reassuring to us. And it makes us feel like we belong if we see other people like us there, right? right? If I walk into a room and it's like all guys there and I'm the only woman, that it initially right. is going like, to make you think, oh, did I walk into the right room, right? right? Am I right. in the right place? Um, because there's nobody else here who looks like me. Maybe right. I don't belong here. Right. And so we get those messages all the time. It's really important for us to have connections with people who are like us. I yeah. think that's really important. Okay. And so organizations that have affinity, affinity groups and, and, and employee resource groups and these kinds of things, you know, some people have said to me, well, Professor Phil, maybe we should get rid of these things. And no, they serve a really important they serve purpose. A purpose. They yeah. serve a really important yeah. purpose. At the same time, if we get so comfortable with seeking similar others and if we we connect that uh, finding similar others with things like status hierarchy and opportunity in the workplace, then we have a problem, right? right? So right. it's not okay for you to seek similarity out for every opportunity that comes along and you, you're not pushing yourself to actually make connections with people who are different right. and give them opportunities as well, yeah. right? So you have to have that mentorship and sponsorship. It is consequential to people's careers, to people's outcomes. You have to be thoughtful about that and right. you have to be willing to connect across those boundaries. That's the job I'm paying you for. Right. I'm not paying you just to create a, a boys network. I'm, right. I'm, I'm paying you to create an organization that is gonna thrive for the future and throughout right. time, right. right? And so it's critically important that we don't waste uh, all of this talent that we right. have in the organization right. by being in some way, some way selfish and lazy right. by just seeking and out people who are like it, us, and right? Everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, this I think this goes uh, hand in hand with this question. This is from Kareen. Do those uh, rules have to come from top management? In other words, like who is? Yeah, yeah. this is another good question. Um, so there's a couple things I would say to this. It's really important to have top management on board and leadership to buy into the benefits of diversity and understand uh, what what norms and things need to be in place, what rules should be in place, et cetera, to make this happen. Um, so yes, leadership needs to be involved and they need to endorse this. But that's not all, <laughs> because the reality is when we look at the data out there, there's a lot of organizations with CEOs who walk the talk, you know, who say this is really important. And then as you go lower down in the organization, you get to what some people have called the, the you know, the frozen middle, mm. right? The people that are doing the work day to day, who are, um, who are finding the, the, the diversity difficult, right? Who are actually experiencing like, oh, these people were fighting with each other. I don't really like that. I don't want my team fighting. You know, they're the ones who are like, 
really important that you get them on board to do the work. Right. They're the ones where it's like easier for them to, in the short term, not have to deal with it, right? right, right and right. you know, they may be saying, they, have to get the work they may be saying, yeah, you don't yeah. pay me enough. Right. You know, you don't pay me enough to deal with this difficulties. Right. I'm just gonna, you know, go find my little niche team and make it work. Yep. Um, and so I think I think it's really critical to recognize that yes, it does. You do need to have the top involved, but you can't stop there. Right. And, and it's a really, um, you know, oftentimes more difficult to get the hundreds and thousands of people who are impacting the daily lives of, mm -hmm. of everybody in the organization. It may be easier to get the 10 people at the top to understand right. that this right. is important than, than it is to get those others. So I think we can't stop, you know, um, there and we have to each do our own individual work as well. So if you are one of those people in the frozen middle, you know, putting forth the effort and then the organization uh, rewarding you for putting forth that effort becomes right. really critical. Right. Right. Well, it's a culture creation, right? Because right? yeah. it's just as important of your net results of your work, right. but the net results of the community That's right. and the people. I mean, I always, you know, I always feel the most important resource to any company are the, are the people, people that work for it. Yeah. So no, this is it. enormously important. Mm -hmm. All right. Teresa writes, how is the transition to a diverse team managed and what time frame is optimal? Ah. Um, there's not a perfect answer for this, yeah. right? I mean, I really think that this depends on lots of things, but I think the important to recognize is that um, it may take a little bit more time for a diverse team to gel, to get on its feet, to build that cohesion and connection, to build the comfort working together um, than, than if you pull together people who look alike, right? right? Okay, right. so I do think you wanna recognize that and right. that there, therefore it may take a little more time than normal and you, got, you may have to have some patience right. um, with getting that team to where it needs to be. Right. And you also need to be deliberate as you're pulling that team together. Um, I'm, I'm a person who actually uh, both have benefited personally and have tried to research and understand the importance of approaching problems as, mm -hmm. as opposed to avoiding them. Right. And so if you know, I'm trying to bring them together this diverse group and it may take a little longer. That's okay. Say that. You know, yeah. be clear and honest about yeah. it. I think it's really important for us to come together as a team to get the perspectives and and experiences of all of these individuals that I have here around the table and it's going to be critically important that we're patient with each other and we learn how to work together. Right? right? And just say that, right? Be honest about it and and put it out there the experience that people might be having. Right? Right, right yeah. exactly. And, you know, to put a time frame on culture creation. Right. It, it's it's all time, like, right? I mean, <laughs> right. It's, it's a consistently evolving thing. That's so, right. you know, it's not really a time frame for that. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Uh, this last question is something we talked about a little bit in the break, too. I think it's a really important question. Uh, this, I have an all-female team because this was what the group wanted. They were tired of gender discrimination. We have started adding men to the teams, and we think the outcomes are better, but we have several women who are very upset about men being in the team. How can I help the women who are upset to have men join because the gender inequality issues our culture has, but to see that this is actually helpful? And does it matter if the diversity is in the group or the team lead? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of questions there. And I think um, this is a this, this interesting context that you described that, was Christine? Uh, anonymous. anonymous. Anonymous, okay. Yeah, that yeah. Anonymous described. Right. Um, it's interesting because most of our research that we've done on this does make assumptions that may be you know, quite invalid and are changing, certainly very rapidly, um, that most of the time when we talk about diversity and diversifying um, a given context, we're oftentimes thinking about you know, this majority of men or whites that mm -hmm. are there mm -hmm. and then bringing in women or people of color, right. which it inherently means that you have people that are in society perceived as high status, integrating people who in society are perceived as low right. status. And right. you've kind of flipped the script and said, look, we have people that are perceived as low status and they have to integrate these high status folks. Right. And so there has been research done on what does it mean to integrate men into a female dominated environment versus, versus a, integrating a female into a male dominated environment and, and the differences that are experienced there. Like right. oftentimes, uh, if you look at the work, what it suggests is that when women are being integrated, they're not treated so nicely, et cetera. Uh, but where men are being integrated, they are treated nicely, like the women right. don't treat them like crap. Um, and so I understand the the concerns that the women have um, because it's not, and it's, it may not be about the diversity itself, but it's about the status dynamics that then mm -hmm. change as you bring men into the environment. And what is the culture that has been created 
you created a culture with all of these women, right. and now that culture may be changing right. as a function of bringing these men in. So you have to be deliberate about maintain. If there's things about that culture that you want to maintain right. that you don't want to see change, you've got to be deliberate about that. You right. have to be really clear that the, this is really important that everybody feels comfortable talking and all of these other things. Right. Um, the other thing I would say here is um, there was a la the last part of her question where she asked. Um, what is she asking? It doesn't matter if it's the group or the team lead, the, the diversity the, right. is the Where, the where is the yeah. diversity? Right. Yeah, no, this is a really another good question because ultimately when we think about the status hierarchy of that team, we know that there's more status for leaders than for right. members. Right. And so you do want to be thoughtful about what is the hierarchy that you're creating if all of the people at the top right. are men and all the people at the bottom are women, right? right. And if you, you know, kind of flip that on its head and you put some women in the top, then it may help to equalize the status differences, right. right? So I do think that it's important to be thoughtful about representation at all levels of the organization, diversification at all levels of the organization. Um, and in fact, you know, most of what companies grapple with that's so hard is that you, you have diversity at the bottom of the organization, but as you get to the top, you see you know, the disappearance um, right. of that diversity. Right. And so I think it's, it is really critical to, yeah. to think about where's the representation um, and how, how is that affecting your ability to get the benefits from everybody. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, You're Catherine. Welcome. This was wonderful. And thank you, and we hope you enjoyed. The conversation continues.